Well, hello, New Life Church. Glad to have you joining us for the message this week. During this Lenten season, as we've been doing messages of focused on circling around the resurrection, on a couple of occasions over the last couple of weeks, I have shared the line of the road to the best things is not through the good things, but through the hard things. Let me give you an example. I, I have two friends from my childhood who both grew up in difficult family environments. One home was excessively violent. The other was characterized by joylessness and a lot of bitterness. One of those friends leaned in on the love and the grace of Jesus. He experienced it deeply um, himself and has lived a life of hope and joy and peace. There are times when I have envied his love and commitment to our Savior. The other friend chose to embrace the generational example of joylessness and bitterness that he grew up in. And his life has seemed to be characterized by decades of unforgiveness and relational dysfunction that has affected virtually every friendship and family relationship that he has. The difference between those two individuals has been the redeeming touch of God's grace on the first friend. A humble spirit combined with a genuine desire for the, for the favor of God to be poured out onto his life in spite of his, his history with a violent family. God granted to my friend um, his favor and God has made all things new for him as we're told about in Revelation 21 verse 5. When we seek God's favor and when we seek God's redemption, even the worst experiences can bring great value. And of course, there are numerous examples where without God's favor, even apparent blessings like wealth and perhaps good health have proven to be less than optimal for individuals, at times even becoming curses in a example of great wealth on a, in a family. In Luke's version of the Beatitudes, in Luke chapter 6, and it's shortened, um, as is his entire version of the Sermon on the, on the Mount that we find in the book of Matthew, but in Luke's version of the Beatitudes, Jesus compares and he contrasts spiritual blessings and curses. And this is what we hear in verses that go back and forth, um, where the blessings are spoken about in verses 20 through 23 of Luke chapter 6, and then the curses are spoken of in verses 24 and following. This is what it says, verse 20, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of, heaven, the kingdom of God. Contrast that with verse 26, But woe to you who are rich! For you have already received your comfort. Back to a blessing. Verse 21. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Verse 25. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Again, verse 21. A blessing. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Verse 25. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Jesus says in verse 22, Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man, for that is how their fathers treated the prophets. Contrast that with verse 26. But woe to you when all men speak well of you, for that is how their fathers treated not the prophets. That's how their fathers treated the false prophets. Jesus is flipping their conventional wisdom on its head. And that conventional wisdom was that wealth and a good reputation and health and ease in life was evidence of God's blessing. And Jesus is the exact opposite. Michael Wilcock, in his commentary in the book of Luke, looks at these verses and he states this, So God's people then will prize what the world calls pitiable and will be suspect of what the world thinks is desirable. Now, I want to clarify, it's okay to appreciate the good things that we enjoy in life. The blessings that come from God they're good for us. We've got to keep them in perspective, all right? And Jesus is not <clears throat> urging, like, purposeful deprivation. 
on our part that we should starve ourselves in order to gain God's blessings. That's not his point, okay? What he is doing is he's <clears throat> he is warning about the condition of our hearts. He's warning us about the attachments of our hearts <clears throat> and the dangers of taking good things and turning them into ultimate things. Because when we do that, they become idols for us and eminently dangerous for our spirits. With that in mind, we come to a parable that many of us are familiar with that we're going to look at today, a parable that speaks about resurrection. It's found in Luke chapter 16, starting at verse 19. It is called the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. A different Lazarus than the Lazarus that we looked at last week in John chapter 11, the Lazarus who was raised from the dead. But this Lazarus is also resurrected. Let's take a look. Luke 16, starting at verse 19. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. And at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. Besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. And the rich man answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Remember that in this story, Jesus is speaking to Pharisees, all right? Now, there's a crowd of people and all, but he's directly directing his comments at Pharisees that he has um, mentioned actually in verse 14 as being people who loved money and were sneering at Jesus. Now, just a little side note, the great danger with any parable is to not see ourselves in it anywhere. If you don't think that you resemble any of the individuals in this parable, you might need to take a closer look, okay? And then side note number two, I'm going to be sharing reflections on this story, not a thorough analysis or thorough treatment of it. Perspectives on, snapshots of a resurrection story. So Jesus is speaking to these self-justified Pharisees who had made wealth their honor. The very fact that we live in a wealthy culture should make all of us stop and take notice of this parable. In reality, we should take notice to any warning about wealth or any story about wealthy individuals in Scripture, knowing that that's our people group that we can kind of identify with because we're among the most wealthy individuals who have ever lived on this earth. In line with the Pharisees' practice, um, practice of, as Jesus accused them in verse, 20, verse 15, that you justify yourselves in the eyes of men. There's something that the Pharisees would have picked up in this story right away that would have served to distance themselves from the truths of the story and, and not apply it to themselves. Okay, Verse 21 says, re related to the beggar Lazarus who was laid at the, st the front step of the rich man's uh, mansion. Verse 21 says, even the dogs came and licked his sores. And any Pharisee would have immediately noticed that dogs licking the man would have made the man unclean. So that justifies the conclusions that they come to about this poor man, all right? And distances themselves from having to deal with him, okay? 
Of course he's not getting blessed. He is unclean, and his uncleanness has cursed him. Or, of course he's poor. He's lazy, and he's lying around. He's not getting up to work. Of course he's sick. He eats crumbs off the dirt. Dirty food that has touched the ground, which makes him unclean as well. Of course he's got COVID. He didn't wear a mask. Of course her daughter got pregnant. She votes Democrat. Okay, so here's a first thought that I have related to this, okay? Jesus wants to free us from the tendency to justify ourselves. But we are woefully guilty of tendencies to justify every action that we take, every attitude that we have, every word that comes out of our mouths. Can we just admit today that in our present context, we are justifying ourselves perhaps more than we ever have before in our lifetimes. I see Facebook posts. I see t-shirts that people wear, caps on their heads. I hear comments made, and I'm so quick to minimize them, the, the other person, and to justify myself. Could I admit that I'm almost certainly more wrong than I think I am? <laughs> Seeing as how I usually think that I'm right, I definitely am more wrong than I think I am. The shocking great reversal of the resurrection, and we talked about that great reversal about a month ago. The shocking great reversal about the resur resurrection, which is where life springs back out of death, totally unexpectedly. It's where evil is overwhelmed by good, even though everybody at Calvary saw Jesus die on the cross. The great reversal of strength being broken through weakness. And the great reversal of a poor, unclean man who gets accepted by God into paradise, while a man who was clearly blessed by God with wealth during this life is rejected throughout all of eternity. All of those scenarios of great reversals related to the resurrection should put us on a quest to honestly value what God values and to unvalue what the world values. And in addition to that, wisdom will, at the very least, hold suspect what many, even in the church today, are inclined to believe. If the Pharisees would have been paying attention, they would have also noticed something else unusual in the story, and that is this. The poor beggar is given a name. His name is Lazarus. The rich man stays nameless. Actually, Lazarus is the only character in any of Jesus' parables that is given a name. Commentators say that the rich man is unnamed because he has no real lasting identity. The only identity that he has built up around himself is related to his wealth. And once he dies, all of that wealth is left behind in the previous life, and he enters the next life without any of it. He has no identity. He has no name. Whatever he, identity he did have during his life was tied to his wealth and prestige, all of which is lost when he dies, which should give us reason to reflect on where are we trying to get our identity from? So here's the lesson. If your identity is found in career success, if your identity is found in your reputation among your peers or your reputation in the community, if your reputation is, is if, your, if your identity is built on your, your place on the team or how often your name gets mentioned in the local paper, if your identity is in your wealth, is, if your sense of identity and importance is based on how many likes you got on your most recent Facebook post, if it is built on your grades at school or whatever honors you received when you graduated from college 10 years ago, if your identity is built on, your, on the accomplishments of your children in school or in sports, those sources for identity will not last. And they most likely will be forgotten within about a week after they are written in your, in your obituary after you die. The resurrection is when the world's system for identity is relegated to the trash heap. 
and the trash heap of history. And our identity in Christ leads us to being named and embraced for eternity right next to the patriarchs in heaven. The story of the resurrection and its aftermath for these two men, and both of them pass through death into a life of some sort, okay? Eternal life for the poor man, the beggar and all, an eternal existence in torment um, for the rich man. This story of the resurrection and its aftermath for these two men would have shaken the foundations of the Pharisees' belief system and contributed further to their wholesale rejection of and resistance to anything associated with Jesus. Jesus knew that their belief system needed dismantling. Not that all of it was wrong, but much of it was flawed. And they continued to build upon it on a flawed foundation, and it needed to be torn apart and needed to be rebuilt. It was a massive project that Jesus was trying to undertake, and it was a process that the Pharisees were unwilling to go through. I came across in my reading this week, and I can't track it down. I'm really frustrated about that. A phrase that I had never heard before, okay? And the phrase was an ethical package deal. And, and, and I don't know if, it, I can't remember if it was in a book or if it was in an article that I read, um, but this phrase, ethical package deal, was applied to politics. Um, and, and the author's point, point was that when people align themselves with a political party, they often end, end up adopting every plank of that party's platform, even when it compromises other beliefs, including their spiritual faith. I think that phrase, ethical package deal, I think it's an accurate dis description of America's political landscape, depressingly so, to be honest. But the more that I thought about it, I thought, well, that can be applied elsewhere also. For example, you probably can tell that I've adopted a very evident sports fan package deal. Now, let me tell you what it looks like. I'm a Minnesota Vikings football fan, which means as part of the package deal, I am very obviously not going to be a Green Bay Packers football fan. I'm a Nebraska Cornhuskers fan. If you know anything about Nebraska Cornhuskers football history, you know that it is impossible to be a Nebraska foot, a Cornhuskers fan, a real fan, and also be at the same time an Oklahoma Sooners fan. That was their major rivalry throughout the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. And anybody who lived through it could never be a fan of the Oklahoma Sooners. I'm an Aitken fan. What's part of that package? Hate to say it, for those of you from Crosby, Ironton, don't take offense at this, all right? But I'm not a fan of the, of the Crosby, Ironton athletic teams, all right? I am a fan of God, which obviously means I cannot be a fan of the New York Yankees. That's part of the package deal, and that one in particular is ordained by God. Obviously, I'm joking about that last phrase. Okay, so there are, there are ethical package deals. There are sports fan package deals. There are faith package deals as well. Back then, there certainly was the, the Pharisees' Jewish faith package deal. Today, there is clearly a Catholic package deal. There is a mainline denomination um, package deal. There is an evangelical package deal. I doubt that Jesus is much of a fan of our faith package deals, friends, because his stories and his teachings targeted foundational beliefs all the time. He, he was constantly trying to break them up because so much of what they believed was built on a faulty foundation. If he was alive in physical form today and speaking in churches from the platform, he would still be taking aim at a lot of our foundational beliefs. Now, do I believe in a lot of elements of what I believe as an evangelical and evangelical dogma? Absolutely, I do. Do I believe everything that is being touted out there by all evangelicals? Absolutely not. Some of it is much too liberal than what I'm willing to embrace. The trend is going in a direction that troubles me. Some of it is far more conservative than I think is wise. So can I, during this Easter season, can I respectfully submit to you that the resurrection 
was in Jesus' teaching about the resurrection before he was resurrected was like an earthquake to everyone's faith package deal? Can I respectfully encourage you to think of the many times, for example, in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you, he said that, one, two, three, he said that six times in the book of Matthew chapter five. He certainly had to have said that dozens, perhaps hundreds of other times in areas that aren't recorded in scripture, all right? Jesus was not hesitant to challenge the settled orthodox teachings of the loudest voices of the faith. And so in this story that we're looking at, the story of the rich man and Lazarus, Jesus is confronting the Pharisees that what they believed about the resurrection wasn't just so. They believed that a man who lived in poverty was unacceptable to God, They believed that a man who lived in wealth was blessed by God and certainly would be welcomed into all of eternity by the hosts of heaven when that individual died. And Jesus rocks their world by telling them a story that's exactly the opposite. Now, that idea of a faith package deal is not the primary application of the story of the rich man and and Lazarus, but it may be among the most relevant applications for our time because so much seems to be going wrong with orthodox evangelical teaching these days in multiple directions. In addition to um, what we've looked at already about the the resurrection here and all, there's much that could be um, considered about hell in this story. I don't want to dwell on it too much, okay, but here's some aspects of hell, all right? Hell is going to be a place where God's blessings are going to be fully removed. Even a simple drop of water will not be permissible. Hell will be a place of blaming others. The rich man implies in the story, believe it or not, that God should be doing much more than simply having sent sent, sent the prophets and sent Moses to teach and to warn the people of Israel. And the rich man certainly implies that if God doesn't do more for his five brothers, well then it's God's fault that they might end up in torment as well. We learn in this passage that hell is a place of self-centered living where people get to choose not God forever. They get to choose themselves forever, which is what the rich man does. The rich man even assumes in this story that Lazarus should still be his errand boy. It's like he commands, Abraham, hey, Abraham, send Lazarus to come and do my bidding, to dip his finger in some water so that he can cool off my tongue. Uh, hell is going to be a place of conscious awareness of what has been lost. He knows that he's lost the pleasurable life, but what's fascinating to me is that we see here that hell is not going to be a place of conscious sorrow, or at least isn't with this man, conscious sorrow, or repentance. The rich man says that his brothers could repent, seems to imply that his brothers should repent, but he himself is unwilling to repent. Related to that, I was intrigued by authors pointing out what he does and doesn't ask for from his position in hell. He asks for relief. He'd like some water. It would help. But in spite of the fact that he's being punished, he doesn't ask for forgiveness. He still doesn't want God. And part of the reason that he still doesn't want God is that years early, he embraced not the truth. He embraced not compassion. He embraced a skewed belief system that allowed him to remain totally self-centered, perhaps fulfilling the, and when I say perhaps, I would say I I would like to think it's likely fulfilling the the minimum required obligations of the faith to to pay for sacrifices and to give a pittance of his income for alms for anonymous poor people. But God forbid that he should go out of his way and and help the specific poor, poor man that actually has a name that is dying on his doorstep. And having adopted, adopted this skewed belief system, um, that allowed his life to revolve around money. And let me clarify this, money itself um, 
is not evil because notice who Lazarus is with in heaven. Lazarus is with Abraham, who was an incredibly wealthy man as the first patriarch of the Jewish people. But he was also a man of incredible deep, incredibly deep faith and a man willing to sacrifice anything, including his own son, for God as he followed what God whispered into his ear from times. So this rich man, instead of God becoming his God, the rich man and the Pharisees in general, they have chosen wealth as their God. I want to wrap up with a reflection. And that is this. Jesus endured the agony of the cross because of his profound love for you so that you wouldn't have to endure the agony, the agony of separation from God in hell. And that agony from the separation of God in hell, I believe, is worse than the physical agony related to hell. After all, on the cross, as Jesus' arms were spread with nails in them and him suffocating, trying to gather his breath as he's pushing up and down on the feet so that in that position like this, he, he could catch a breath in that time of excruciating pain. You know what Jesus didn't cry out? He didn't cry out, my God, my God, the pain from these nails is overwhelming. He didn't cry out, my God, my God, the suffocation is agony. My God, my God, I can, I can barely put up with the, the pain in my feet from pushing down on those ankles. The, the, the wood from the back is raw on my skin. My God, my God, the crown of thorns is, is just excruciating. He didn't cry out any of those things. Why? I think there was something that was more important that thing was. He was being, his father, God, was turning his back on him, which is why Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the deepest agony of his being, and it is related to soul agony, not body agony. The separation for, from his father was more unbearable than any physical pain that he was undergoing. He chose to undergo the pain of separation from his father so that we wouldn't have to, even though we are so prone to choose money as our God or an identity built on a built on a, a on, on our reputations and that becomes our god or sexual fulfillment becomes our god or luxurious living becomes our god so knowing of that amazing expression of love that he has for us where he was willing to say i'm willing to go to hell you know the apostle apostles creed confirms that what Orthodox Christianity has believed for the better part of two centuries right now, he descended into hell. Jesus Christ was willing to go to hell, separation from his Father, and endure the agony of that. Knowing that he was willing to do that, why wouldn't we submit ourselves fully to someone who has shown that depth of love to us? Why wouldn't we give of ourselves and give of our means in contrast to this rich man who gave, gave very little and didn't respond to the needs of anyone around him? Why wouldn't we give generously of the time that God has blessed us with knowing that there are others that are hurting for our time? Why would we not be willing to endure difficulty and suffering, perhaps persecution at some point in the future, knowing that it is but a fraction of what he has done for us. This teaching about a rich man who seemingly had God's stamp of approval on his life during this year, but to the Jews, incredible shock, they found out that he really didn't, that he was unacceptable in God's eyes because his heart was so hardened. And that story about this man, Lazarus, poor in spirit as well as financially poor, who nonetheless at some point had to have turned his eyes to God and humbled himself and asked for God's help and gets welcomed into eternity. This teaching of an upside-down resurrection, a res resurrection characterized by the phrase, the great reversal, should touch our hearts 
in our spirits, to live and to follow after God and to love him with all of our hearts. Let's pray. Would you forgive us, God, for at times having adopted beliefs that go along with some faith package or maybe political ethical package deals, God, that don't align with your word? Forgive us, God, for living in a way that oftentimes ignores the desperate needs of people around us. Open our eyes, God, to the reality that there are people who are marching on a pathway that leads to an eternity separated from you, an eternity that would be agonizing in more ways than one. And God, give us opportunities, give us a compassionate heart for them, help us to reach out to them and to show them love, whether they are the poorest of the poor or among the most wealthy in our community. Make us like Jesus. Continue, God, to refine what we believe. May our lives reflect not what the pundits are, pundits are saying or writing on our news feeds. May our lives reflect the values of the kingdom of God that we so desperately want to be welcomed into when it comes time for our final breath. This is my prayer for myself. This is my prayer for each person watching. Thank you for your love for us. We desire to love you and to follow you faithfully in return. In Christ's name, amen. I want to thank you for joining us today. I hope you have a wonderful week. God bless you all. We'll see you actually in a couple of weeks, all right? There won't be a message next week because we do have a special speaker who's going to be coming and speaking to us. But join us again on Easter Sunday. God bless you all.